variables, so similar to one another. So let's cover a general problem here. x over, let's do two, x plus 1. Uh, or, yeah, plus let's do, um, I don't know, 1 over x minus 2 divided by 3 over x squared minus x minus 2. All right, let's pretend we had a, a um, complex fraction like this. Now, um, a couple things to remember. We didn't like fractions, right? So what we worked on this was eliminating our fractions. Now, in Algebra 2, many of you guys were very quick to remember, well, if we, just mo if we always get the common denominator, then we can just use the numerators, right? And that's what you guys like, had in in your, um, memorized. And that's fine. Like, that works. And then you factor this, and you say that's x plus 1 times x minus 2. So that got simplified, right? And so now you can see that they all have the common denominators. So then you took the numerators. Now, I didn't really like that explanation because many of you guys didn't understand why that worked. So what I explained to you is the reason why that works is because once you get common denominators, now you can multiply everything times x minus 2 times x plus 1. And when you do that, the denominators all get um, divided out, and you're just left with a x times x minus 2 plus, oh, let's change this to a minus, minus an x plus 1 all over 3. Right? And now, can we just go ahead and simplify this? to give us an x squared minus 2x minus x minus 1 over 3, which is x squared minus 3x minus 1 divided by 3, right? And then the other thing we want to talk about is the restrictions, right? Remember, guys, the restrictions are the values that x cannot equal. Well, if you look at the simplified problem, is there any values that x cannot be? No, but remember when we were talking about restrictions, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and complex fractions, we just didn't care about the simplify result. We also had to look over here and say, well, the original problem, I know x cannot equal negative 1 and 2, right? Because that would have made my denominator 0 in my original problem, correct? So then we talked about those restrictions. OK, so that's complex fractions. Now. Let's pretend you have a rational equation that looks very similar. Okay. Now, before we even go any further, I actually didn't teach it this way, but it's actually a good idea to do this, because uh, I think this helps you guys understand extraneous solutions better. Do we already have some values that we know x cannot equal? Yeah, why don't we just write those down? x equals negative 1, or x cannot equal negative 1 and positive 2. You guys agree with me? OK, so let's just actually kind of leave that to the side. We know, based on this original equation, it cannot equal those. Now, rather than doing the Algebra 2 method this time, I'm just going to go the way that I taught you. I said, guys, yeah, that makes sense, and you can do it. But in reality, like, why get the common denominators and then multiply by the common denominator? The easiest, the faster way that you can do it is just multiply by the common denominator. Now, students usually didn't like this method because they had a hard time identifying the common denominator. But if you look at identifying the common denominator like you did in Algebra 2, you can still like, you can identify what the common denominator is rather quickly. And it's just going to save you a little bit of work and time. Because obviously, this now gets divided into x plus 1, x minus 2. Okay, And the reason now doing it this method, it's the same thing you're doing here. But what happens is when you multiply this common denominator times every single term, like when you multiply this times this fraction, the x plus 1's divide out. Agreed? So we're just left with an x times x minus 2. When you multiply an x minus 2 times x plus 1 with this, the x minus 2's divide out, and you're just left with a x plus 1. And then here, the denominators divide out, and you're left with a 3. If you wanted to do common denominators and do the Algebra 2 method, there's, no, there's not a problem. I just feel like this process is a little bit sooner. Now, if you guys remember on your quiz, actually, we reviewed these. Because I was so happy. I'm like, oh my god, you guys got all the like Majority of the class 
went from here to here and I was like super happy. And then I got super bummed because looking at this, I noticed that many students stopped right here. It's like they had no idea what to do from this point. We're solving, guys. If it's one variable x or it's linear, use inverse operations. But once you, what you guys figure out is crap. This is not linear. This is a quadratic. So for a quadratic equation, we got to set this equal to 0 and either solve by factoring or by the quadratic formula. And I think I gave you guys one, one of each on your quiz. So when I subtract, when I set this equal to 0, oh, sorry, that's a minus 3x, minus 4 equals 0. Now I want to go and check my, now I got to go ahead and solve this. So I go ahead and solve. And by factoring, fortunately, I chose something that is factorable. And x equals 4, and x equals negative 1. However, let's go back to that original idea that we talked about here. That solves the equation here, but is negative 1 work for our original problem? No, so this is extraneous. And I think it's important for you guys to understand because like some test questions I've seen, the answer choices look like this. Right? So it includes both 4 and negative 1. So if you algebraically get this, but you don't understand that it's extraneous, you would be tempted to do answer A. Right? But the real answer is B. Okay? Or some people will just notice that negative 1 is a solution, and they see no solution, then they figure maybe, oh, but no, 4 is a solution, just not negative 1. Okay? So that is your review on that.